All right, guys, so if you haven't seen this plane yet, uh, I don't know where you've been, but Mike's Wilga has been getting a lot of attention, and a lot of you guys have commented in the, the comments section that you'd like to see more about it, so I got Mike here. I'm figuring we should take this second to check out his incredible airplane. I'm Trent Palmer. I fly drones for a living and bush planes for fun. Follow along as I journey off the beaten path of aviation. What's up, Mike? How you doing, buddy? Want to show me the Wilga? Let's do it. All right. First of all, just tell me the basics of what the plane is, what it started as, and then how you got here. Okay, so it's a Wilga PZL-104. Uh, it's a backcountry bush plane developed in the 50s, I think, <laughs> long time ago. And uh, it's always intrigued me. Normally, they have a 260 horsepower radial on the front of it. Um, and it's a great plane. It was developed to pack gear uh, into uh, war areas where there's no runway, no improvement, so it has a really crazy suspension. That was my platform. Yeah. So. And then what have you done to it? Yours didn't have the radial. Correct. What did you have? What did you do to it? Okay, so in 2006, they decided to reintroduce the Wilga that hadn't been in production for a long time. They made 24 from 2006 to 2008, and uh, I initially showed up here at Oshkosh and saw the new version of the Wilga with a Lycoming 540. I fell in love with it, and uh, they said they wouldn't sell it. I was fortunate enough to talk them out of it, and I bought serial number one in 2006. And I flew it for about a 1,000 hours, loved it, sold it because I like to try a bunch of different planes, thinking I'll just buy another one later. Right after I sold it, they discontinued making it, and I tried for 10 years to find another Wilga 2000, is what it's called. Okay. That was the newer version. And uh, after 10 years of hunting, I found the last one ever made. So the book ends, I have the first and the very last. This is serial number 24, last Wilga ever made, and I bought it. And uh, I wanted to fix the problems I had with my first one. Great plane at sea level. It just really was on the backside of the power curve as soon as we got up to the back country I live in, high altitude, hot and heavy. It just couldn't quite do it. So I had this silly idea here. All right, so my silly idea was, if I don't have enough power, well, it kind of got amplified. I was flying this plane around, knowing I wanted to do a turbine, I wanted to upgrade it, but I was in a formation flight for a photo shoot with a bunch of planes over the water, and this engine blew up on me, the piston engine. It threw two rods out of the side. I almost put it in the water. Uh, fortunately, I, I got what cylinders were left kind of running alive enough to bump it up off the water uh, and then it just blew apart. I blew smoke and smoke in the cabin and I dead sticked it with just about uh, 50 yards off the shore into a farmer's crop field of corn Yeah. and uh, jumped out of the plane, didn't hurt it, got it on great, billowing smoke come out, ha coming out of the airplane and I thought, well, now's the time. Let's put a PT-6 in it. So yeah. that kind of pushed it. Let's get it done. Yeah. And then, of course, Mike, just putting a PT-6 on it wasn't enough. <laughs> what else did you do? You um, did everything. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Trent! <laughs> All right, so we'll start. The PT-6 is a Pratt Whitney PT-6-28. makes 715 thermodynamic horsepower. Uh -huh. Gearbox limits me to 680. So 680 horsepower is what I use. 
Um, and it, it worked out great, it's a lot of fun. So that's the power plant. Prop was made by MT, it's a 102 inch four blade. Oof. Has a huge biting cord on it. And it launches more like um, a drag car than any plane I've ever had. It's, it drops you in your seat and it's gone. So that worked out really good, it was a great package. Um, around here, I, I changed the suspension system, remade the trailing link gear, mm -hmm. machined my own axles because you couldn't fit 35s on it. They came with little 950-ish size tires. So I machined new axles, put big tires. The brakes weren't big enough to stop a 35. So while I was making the axles, I made new hub assemblies, uh, made a new braking system and add, doubled up on the brakes. So we redid all the brakes, the axles, and uh, put on some big tires. Putting on a PT6, they're gas guzzlers, um, but not relation, relative to... That is so cool. <laughs> so PT6, they drink a lot of gas because they make a lot of power. They're actually extremely efficient. I actually get a longer range, surprisingly, with the same, with the relative fuel with this motor because I can go to only 28 gallons an hour, go up high, pull the power back, go 700 miles range, I'm only burning 28 gallons an hour. My other plane had to stay down low, it didn't have enough horsepower to go up high. Yeah. And so what I had to do was I'd burn 26 gallons an hour, which is less, but I went 40 miles an hour slower than what this does up high. Okay. So I'm actually, per mile, I do better with the Pratt & Whitney than I did with the light combing that I had in it. But I wanted to add more fuel because if I'm really gonna huck the coal to it, it can guzzle it down respectively. So I made this uh, gear tank. This is all fuel inside here. Yeah. There was two reasons I did this. The wings have very little dihedral. They're a very flat wing. And before I did this engine, if I got into some really rick wicked slot canyons that I had to walk uh, a slip back and forth down in and I'm chasing the fuel selector side to side to drop it down the walls in uh, Southern Utah, it was really easy to get it to suck air into the, the fuel system and start to sputter. So that made it really interesting. So I decided I'd, I'd do a gear leg like this. This is still one wing or one fuel tank on this wing, but it's this wing feeds this tank through a large line. My fuel pickup is at the bottom of this funnel. So if I have even one gallon of fuel, I have almost 12 inches of fuel above my pickup and I can't put this in an attitude, including inverted, that can get air to that. This is 100% fuel, the air vents at the top. So there's no way to suck air, no matter how radical I put this plane. So I got more gotcha. fuel, stuck it in the tank. So, gotcha. Um, wings. This plane, um, I couldn't land. Well, I couldn't go where any of my Carbon Cub buddies would go. It had a really long ground roll for takeoff. It's a big, heavy plane. Uh, if I was up in the high mountains with my friends, it could use 2,000 feet of runway. Sea level was only 400. But as soon as you went up, it, it, the curve against the power and weight was, was horrible. So I decided uh, the power fixed the ground roll because I had the power to get off. But my approach to land was 57 mile an hour stall speed on this aircraft. So I decided I wanted to build a new wing and change the airflow. <laughs> so I decided I want to build a new wing and uh, get my stall speed down. My goal was to get at least 10 miles an hour slower. Yep. I made every effort I could to get as slow as possible. So I actually lengthened the cord of the wing. I added cord over a foot to the wing I completely changed the airfoil when I remade the wing. So I added both cord, I added six inches of length per side, I enlarged my flaps, I enlarged my ailerons, I stretched my ailerons, and I was hoping for that 10 mile an hour reduced stall speed. And ultimately after flight testing, I ended over 20 miles an hour slower stall. So I'm into the 30s now instead of 57. <laughs> so um, that really helped. That's instead insane. of a landing. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So that worked out good. Let's see, what else did we do? We put in a new panel. Used to have steam gauges. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's got way, way more fancy stuff than I know how to use. So uh, I put in an autopilot, three access, yaw damp uh, included. So that's been really nice for getting up high and cruising. Uh, I put in a night vision camera up on the wing up here so I can see in the, in the, at night. I put a backup camera. I use it actually a lot when I'm pairing up with all my friends to see them joining. I put a really bright backup light on it. Um, so it actually we kind of use it like moths to a flame. We, we sometimes, all the flying cowboys are from several different states that we all like to fly with. 
We join up in the sky often. It's hard to find planes. So I actually put airline landing lights on it. It's the brightest lights you can get. So they're the upgraded lights for 737s. And then I put a really bright light on the back. It's like turning on the sun. And so I'll get up in the air, we'll turn on the lights, and then anybody within 15 miles can see me and we converge and then we find each other. So we just go for the light. So that worked out really good. Um, yeah, and I will tell you the light flying behind them <laughs> is like, I could not believe how easy it is to see you. We get, you know, especially when there's harsh lighting conditions or weird contrast, it's really hard to see some of these planes and their different colors. Even my plane, everyone says is invisible aside from my white stripes, but his with that light, you're not missing it. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I get the, I get the, Mike, turn your lights so I can find you. Then they get closer, they, Mike, turn off them damn lights. <laughs> you're gonna burn my retinas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it worked out good. Uh, on the back of the plane, we, we redid the back. I built the crazy tail wheel back here. Um, I enlarged the elevator. I enlarged the rudder um, to give me more control at slower flight. The tail wheel, a wheel already has 325 pounds of weight on the tail wheel with nobody in it. Wow. Since all your weight, four people and your bags is all behind your front tires, yeah. you can get that tail wheel over a thousand pounds. And so here's what happened to me on the beaches everywhere I went. I'd come in and land on a beach, my 35s could ride on top, and the little tail wheel on the back would just dig a trench, and I'd come to a stop and you couldn't see the tire. Just it's just pizza gone. Pizza cutter. Yeah, just pizza cutter went in the ground. So this chunk of aluminum right here was a hundred plus pound block of solid aluminum. Carved new forks, made new pivots, uh, a new bearing set, uh, machined the whole thing. Then I put a shimmy dampener on it. It used to the stock wheel, get anytime you landed, that back wheel would shimmy like crazy. There's nothing you could do about it. You could tighten the bearing set. You could do everything, stop it for a week, and then it just starts shaking. So I built a shimmy dampener with a pivot system in it, and now my tail wheel doesn't move at all. So that's done. You can see my backup light and camera oh, yeah. up there. Um, I don't know what else. Mike, I just realized we forgot two things. Oh, one, <laughs> one is what the heck's going on on the wingtips. The second <laughs> is what's your takeoff or landing distance? <laughs> yeah, well, if we're bush flying, that's probably the most important question. So uh, I think I know exactly what, well, I know exactly what my takeoff is, the way I've got it set up now. Last night I was flying it at about 3,000 pounds, empty weights 2,400, gross weights 4,000. So I had a bit of fuel and just me. So at 3,000 pounds, my three runs on competition scored was 124 feet, 118 feet, and 118 feet. So within six feet and two matching, I, I think I pretty well, that's about what it's gonna be until, I don't know, I find a new trick. Um, landing roll, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not as targeted. Uh, my range uh, fluctuated over 20 feet. I'm right around 160 feet uh, landing roll. And so I got some room to perfect my abilities there but we'll get there. So 160, using, 118. And you're using beta and reverse on landing. Yeah, I'm using a lot of reverse. So I'm coming in, I'm still coming in pretty fast. I'm not quite comfortable getting to the horn on my plane yet. So when I, when I set the mains down, I click it into reverse and I give it at least 300 horsepower of reverse thrust and it stops me fast. So it makes up for my flaws. <laughs> <laughs> and the wingtips. The wingtips. Oh, let me show you the wingtips. Just the quick and dirty on those, and the then we can go. The quick and dirty on the wingtips. May I never use this carbon composite. Basically, it's a leaf spring. I've made a giant machined uh, part that tied into the all three spars of the Wilga. The Wilga has three spars in it. And I put a giant machine bracket in, tied that in. This can take 800 pounds of upward force before it will touch the tip of my aileron. That's in case I screw up and I ground loop my plane. <laughs> so the idea is almost every wheel in existence has been ground looped. They, they're, a, they're a bit of a challenging plane to fly with this really radical suspension. So they tend to get ground looped easy. Most of the time they come down, hit the wing, they crunch the aileron, break the tip, they have to tear it apart, inspect the spars. So I decided, you know what? Let's give it 16 inches of suspension absorb it, soften the impact, or even if I'm lucky, I can come down like most wingtip ground loops. They just kind of drag it for a second and come back up. If that's the case, I won't hit anything, touch anything. I can't hurt the spar at all unless I really wreck it. So 
may you never see a bunch of rock scratches on the bottom of that but if <laughs> yeah. you do maybe my wing will be safe so that was the idea awesome <laughs> let's hope it's a complete waste of my time <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now for the questions everyone's wanting to ask. What are you getting for climb rate, cruise, stall, fuel burn? Okay, so climb is the funnest. <laughs> uh, if I take off my normal pitch angle on rotation is just pitch right for 30 knots, or sorry, 30 degrees. Okay. And um, I, I don't rotate till about 45 miles an hour, Yeah. which is about 10 miles an hour above my stall. So 45 miles an hour I rotate, I pitch for a 30 degree deck angle, and right on rotation, that will hit immediately 4,000 feet a minute. And, uh, and, and at 4,000 feet a minute, my airspeed will be gaining. Um, I can get about 50 miles an hour increased airspeed while at 30 degrees deck within 1,000 feet. Jeez. So it's really, it's really weird. I, I, usually on any of the bush planes I've been flying, you, you, you get it off the ground mm -hmm. and you pitch for stall and you try and ride that and clear an obstacle. This is the first bush plane I've, it's fun to fly where I, I don't even look at the airspeed indicator because you're sunk in your seat. It's gaining speed and you're just looking for your deck. So it's been fun. So 4,000 feet a minute is a, is a real world number. Um, top speed is 180 miles an hour. To do that, uh, the Wilga has a red line of 100 and about 150 miles an hour, 140 knots is its red line, 150 miles an hour. So I can't do any faster than that B and E down low. So down low, I can do 150 miles an hour. I'm using about half throttle, about 150 mile an hour cruise. Um, so down low, you burn more fuel on a turboprop. So I'm burning 28, 29 gallons an hour down low at 150 miles an hour. If I wanna save fuel, 4,000 feet a minute, I can be in the nice cool there and in two to three minutes, 16, 17,000 feet, level it off. Now I'm 170, 180 miles an hour at almost the same fuel flow. Just thinner air, I'm not in the red line and I can push it up. And you have oxygen. I have oxygen, I got four place oxygen on board. I got two massive tanks. We came out here from Salt Lake City to Oshkosh and I used a third of a third of my onboard oxygen. So I can come all the way across the country and return and still have a third left roughly of oxygen on board. Wow. So um, what else did we miss? Stall speed, it's, it's actually unknown yet. I, uh, I took it up for all my flight programs. It's, it's been flying eight days now. So I'm still ringing it out. I took it up to where I got what I believe to be first onset. Um, I always normally take it to a full break but that, uh, that part of the flight test was the, one of the first ones. I didn't have a parachute on. All my initial flight test, I had parachutes. I was doing all kinds of more radical things. And one day I said, let's, let's just kind of get it near a stall and I'll bring it over. The deck angle was steep enough that um, I actually got uncomfortable. My airspeed got to 20 mile, 29 miles an hour indicated. Uh, I can tell you at the deck angle I'm at that that is not accurate. Yeah. Um, I'm not getting a true reading. I'm, I'm pitched too steep. So it's something north of 29. So I'll have to do a calibrated box to find out what that is. But uh, my best guess right now is 35 to 37 mile an hour stall. Same as I get. Uh, I, thanks. I, I don't know what it is though, but I can tell you when I got it at that deck angle and it wasn't stalling, I was, I was convinced when I do take it to a full brake stall, it's gonna come over probably backwards and right. So the thing is at that, at that deck angle, I could never even land the thing. It is, it's hanging. Yeah. And so even at the competition here the other night, um, I calibrated my angle of attack at that. And I marked that as a stall, even though I'd never stalled it. I marked that as my stall coming in here. I'm not hitting my horn and I'm 10 miles an hour above that number. Oh, wow. and, and I'm still rolling my tire for 20 feet on the ground before it comes down. The wing's nowhere near letting go. So um, I feel good about it, but I don't know what the stall is yet. We'll find out. Give me another week. <laughs> Sweet. All right, so how much did I pay to build it? Should we say what I told my wife? Or <laughs> <laughs> what it really was? Well, let's see. You know, I, I took the motor, I fixed, I sold it. And I used that money to buy this other type of motor, so it's pretty close. <laughs> I think that's what I said. No, um, it, I would, I don't know what it cost me. I haven't added it up. I, if I don't put a price on my time, it's probably about a million dollars to build is my get, best guess. Yeah. Um, 
and I'm worth at least a dollar an hour, so maybe a million and three thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right, thank you, Mike. That was awesome. I'm so excited to see this thing fly, and I'm gonna come fly with you guys. I think I need to. Well, yeah, yeah. Flying Cowboys Unite, let's go. We're doing it. <laughs> Hope you guys liked this video. If you did, you know the drill. Hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't. See you on the next one, peace.